So let's start without, uh, without a projection. Um, I mean, so what we would actually have on this slide is a couple of different phases of AI history. Yeah? It starts with the first beginnings, which was um, yeah, in the 1950s when these guys in the United States uh, defined the term artificial intelligence. Um, and Im this was immediately followed by the logic era. Huh? So here it says logic solves all problems. I already told you that many um, AI researchers, in particular logicians, they believed they could solve all problems with, with logic. But this is actually not true. And they should have known better at that time because Gödel already in the 1930s proved his two theorems. The first one, which was very positive, saying that in first order logic um, every theorem can be proven by a mechanical procedure, but this is only true for first order logic. And first order logic is not powerful enough to uh, describe everything we need in practice. Huh? First, very often we talk in higher order logic. Huh? As soon as I am able in my language to talk about parts of the language, this is higher order logic. Huh? Um, and of course I can do this. I can talk about myself and I can talk about that I am talking here. That's what I do right now. No, right now I'm talking that I'm talking about talking. Huh? So this is already third order logic and this can all not be formulated with first order logic. And Gödel proved that there are true statements um, in as, uh, no, as soon as the logic is a little bit more than first order logic, there are true statements which cannot be proven at all. Uh, so this really shows limits for uh, applied reasoning. Um, and also, I already mentioned that in first order logic there is only true and false, nothing in between. Nothing about I am pretty sure that and so on. And that's what we use every day in everyday reasoning. Uh, but logic uh, cannot formalize this. Yeah? So they should have known that there are severe limitations. But yeah, I mean, this was the belief uh, we can solve everything or maybe almost everything with logic. Um, OK, and then. Um, then there was this phase called the New Connectionism. Why the New Connectionism? I showed that in 1940, around that time, uh, McCulloch and Pitts, they already formalized neural networks mathematically. So they had a mathematical description of, about what a neuron is or a neural network. Um, so this is actually not interesting for you. He, I'm, I'm pretty sure he can manage it by himself. Huh? Um, yeah, in the, in, the, in the 1940s they formalized what neur neurons are, but they could not implement it, and therefore the new connectionism, which started in the 1980s. Huh? And uh, this was uh, pretty similar. Um, many people we are very optimistic that with neural networks which are adaptive and they can learn and they can deal with uh, fuzzy uh, knowledge. Um, so it looked like neural networks, they, they overcome all the limitations of logic. Huh? But they didn't see at that time that there were severe weaknesses with the neural networks because um, the problem is they are only fuzzy. But as soon as you as an engineer want to understand what the neural network does, they had no chance at that time to understand what the neural networks do. Uh, but then if you cannot understand anything, how can you solve problems if there is a bug in your implementation, if the neural network doesn't do what you want? 
you don't understand it. So that turned out somewhat later, let's say uh, mid of the 90s, people really discovered that there is no software engineering for neural networks, no chains, yeah? no hierarchical decomposition, it doesn't work. Yeah? Um, so um, then people started, um, yeah, we could, we could say the new probability area started uh, reasoning with probabilities so to uh, model uncertainty with probabilities, that was the era after the neural networks era. And even the neural networks people, they started to uh, investigate the neural networks with probability theory, with a probabilistic calculus. Yeah? So this is what we see here with uh, reasoning under un uncertainty. Um, yeah, then... Um, distributed uh, agents and also autonomous agents. That was in, in the mid-90s uh, um, where this came up as a goal. Uh, of course, all the time this was a goal to, to build intelligent robots, but it was not realistic. So uh, from the mid-90s on, it started to become realistic. Yeah? And then um, maybe now we are in the phase where we, which we can call uh, AI has grown up. Uh, I mean, it's quite interesting. Meanwhile, um, if you ask somebody what is artificial intelligence, you go on the street in Weingarten and you ask what is künstliche Intelligenz, I guess most people would have at least a rough idea about what it is. Huh? If you would have asked them 15 years ago, I guess most of them wouldn't have any idea. And, what, and, and the reason is that AI has been quite successful in a number of applications and of course the newspapers, television, they report about these successes and that's why people know a little bit about what AI is because it has gro is, is grown up now. And what, what means grown up? There are real applications out in the industry, the real applications in software. Just look at Amazon, look at Google, uh, other search engines. Uh, without AI, they wouldn't be uh, by far not as good as they are. Uh, but these are just a few examples. There are so many examples of AI in practice. Okay, here uh, we have a diagram uh, with the time drawn on the horizontal axis. Um, and the vertical axis is uh, about the different paradigms in AI. Uh, so let's start here. Up here we have symbolic AI. Uh, so uh, that's why here we have first order logic, which is the extreme symbolic end of AI. And on the other extreme, this is numerics, uh, so just numbers and uh, pure numerical mathematics. This is the neural networks uh, thread. And then there are some threads in between. Um, for example, I put propositional logic pretty far down here. Yeah, because, I mean, if you look at Boolean algebra, this is more or less how a computer chip works, nothing else. Yeah? And, and, so, and, and this is pretty low level. This is pretty low level. It's not a high level symbolic language, what you have with probabil probabilistic logic. That's why I put it so low. Then we have fuzzy logic, which is actually more powerful because uh, we don't have these two uh, values, zero and one, truth, truth values. They have infinitely many values in between. So it's much more powerful than propositional logic. Here we have decision tree learning, which is a very particular field. And that's why this thread here is uh, very narrow in this uh, time range. Um, yeah, we will see this later how 
decision tree learning works. Uh, then we have probabilistic reasoning up here. Uh, this is, m of course, much more powerful than prob uh, propositional logic. It's more powerful than fuzzy logic. Um, and as you can see here, nowadays this is uh, pretty important. Maybe we should have uh, made this even wider. Yeah, maybe from 2000 to 2010, uh, this becomes even wider. Yeah. And then we have the first order logic thread, which, is, which was yeah, during the logic area here very important. Uh, it is still important, but not that much. Definitely less. Uh, um, yeah. This uh, point in time is where the, uh, the term artificial intelligence uh, was born in 1956. Okay, so yeah, let's let's talk about agents. I mean, the term agent is uh, very uh, common today in AI. And so, what is what is an agent? Typically, in AI, in AI, we have software agents, and a software agent is nothing but a box with input-output behavior. Huh? And of course, it uh, communicates with the user. Um, then we may have hardware agents um, which do not just via keyboard and uh, screen communicate with the user. Uh, they communicate with the environment directly. So they don't have to ask the user what can you see and uh, type it in. Uh, such a hardware agent has its own sensors and therefore it has a perception of the environment. Uh, and based on these perception inputs, the agent does some actions which are communicated to actuators. These actuators may be motors that drive wheels and so the, uh, the agent can move or the actuators may be a robot arm that can do movements or it may be anything. I mean, this may even be an, an, uh, a car, for example. It, uh, it may be a network agent that gives some uh, action values to some other components in a computer network, whatever. Huh? Finally, these manipulations, they uh, have influence on the environment and then the perception starts again. This is the infinite loop in which such an agent um, works. Okay, um, yeah, different views of agents. So there is uh, the, the simplest agent is a reflex agent, which is just a function all from the set of all its inputs to the set of all outputs. And this set of all outputs may be actions. Uh? But what's very important, uh, the re reflex agent is a function. In contrast to an agent with a memory, uh, agent with a memory uh, may store what happened before. Uh? And maybe this agent with a memory has a long-term memory, so it may, it may know 1,000 steps from the past, uh, what the inputs have been, and what it has done also. And therefore, it's no longer a function because a function has to be unique. And the agent with the memory may, for the same input, now do something. And one time step later, for the same input, it may do something different depending on the history. Huh? So if you view this agent as mapping input onto output, the agent with memory is no longer a function. Yeah? Is this clear? Um, but we could, uh, we could, 
we could make a function out of it again what would we have to do how could we yes perfect yeah um, so this function would map the contents of the memory plus the input of the agent onto its output and then of course it is a function because, no, not of course, but then we can make a function out of it because we want to have our uh, we want our agent to be deterministic that means with the same memory contents and the same input it would do the same thing all the time okay and then of course we now we want uh, our agents to be able to learn their behavior um, then distributed agents Markov decision processes um, this is pretty important in machine learning because this is a simple type of decision problems um, where um, the decision of the agent depends only on the current state and not on the history so this is yeah this is a special kind of reflex agent yeah? and then we will also talk about goal oriented agents which are of course uh, quite interesting because the idea is I just tell the agent what is the goal but not how to reach the goal and the, the agent will uh, find a solution maybe via planning or machine learning uh, to find such a goal okay yeah so look at this example um, this is um, we consider two agents which uh, work as a spam filter huh? and now look at uh, the results I mean uh, this uh, table here uh, shows us um, so a spam filter gets as input an email and has to classify the email as being spam or good yeah? um, now here we have the correct class it may be um, uh, email that the user wants to get that means the desired here or it may be spam yeah? and now um, our spam filter uh, decides uh, a perfect spam filter would of course for the desired emails always decide desired and for the spam emails always decide spam so a perfect spam filter would have a zero here and a zero here yeah? because uh, all the entries here they are errors yeah? so this is an error where a spam mail was classified as desired and uh, these 11 here are errors where a desired email was classified as spam uh, wrongly classified okay now here we see this spam filter has 12 errors uh, now look at this agent number two um, here we have zero errors and there are 38 so altogether 38 errors um, and now the question you can read here is agent 2 worse than agent 1 suppose this is your personal spam filter which one would you prefer the first one why because yes I mean here we have 12 errors and there we have 38 errors and therefore you would prefer number one okay I would prefer agent 2 because uh, um, when I want an uh, email from my friend get in the spam filter it is very more frustrating than a uh, spam email I get in my in, uh, input box yeah right. yeah yes I would also prefer agent 2 because this agent one loses one email which was maybe pretty important for me yeah? the, it loses one email that I wanted to have this um, agent um, does not lose any um, 
uh, yeah, it does not lose any desired uh, males. Huh? So this agent number two does not classify any desired emails as spam. Huh? So I don't lose any males, but on the other side here, I mean, I have to bother with uh, 37 more males than here. Uh, of course, this is inconvenient, but I mean, clicking a spam away costs me, let's say, one second per spam. So this is uh, 37 seconds lost if I use agent number two. But if this one email that I lose with agent number one was important, I guess I would lose more than 37 seconds of my life. Huh? And therefore, uh, I would prefer agent number two. So what, what we learn from this is these two classes of errors, they do have different costs involved. Huh? So, um, so I would say um, this type of error here um, um, no, which one is it correct? Is it desired? Yeah, this, I, oh, the, here we actually lose 11, 11 emails. Huh? Um, this is about a factor of 100 more costly than the other, the other error. Huh? So we, we should model the whole thing with costs. So we, we should multiply the number of errors by the cost for this type of error and this number of errors multiplied by the cost involved with this error. And then, if we then compare these two guys and this type of error is 100 times more costly, then obviously we would prefer this guy. Okay. Um, and therefore, we, we define here a cost-oriented agent. The goal of a cost-oriented agent is to minimize the long-term cost caused by wrong decisions. Huh? The sum of all weighted errors results in the total cost. Huh? Okay, and we will see an as an example later on uh, this appendicitis diagnosis system, Lexmate. Uh, which actually is a cost-oriented agent. Uh, um, I mean, sometimes you see the definition of a utility-based agent. I mean, this is just uh, the, the, the opposite view of the whole thing. It is to maximize the long-term benefit. Uh, and maximizing the long-term benefit is the same as minimizing the long-term cost. Okay, so then if we talk about agents, uh, it's of course very important in what type of environment such an agent um, acts. Uh, so uh, the environment may be observable. That means at any time I know the perfect state of the environment. For example, a chess computer. All the time the chess computer knows or at least should know uh, the exact uh, state of the chessboard. Uh, um, but in practice, especially in robotics, um, the environment is only partially observable. Uh, for example, uh, if I have to do something in this room, move around and pick up something, I don't see everything. Many parts of, of the room are hidden, I can see them from here, so it's only partially observable. Then, um, of course, it's uh, important whether the environment is deterministic. So that means whether the environment always reacts in the same way of my, uh, to my actions. This, of course, is not true in real-world robotics uh, environments, but, for example, in the eight puzzle, uh, it is deterministic because, I, we will see the eight puzzle, it's a, uh, this little uh, puzzle with nine tiles in a square and you have to arrange them in the right way. Yeah? And it is deterministic because there is no op opponent which may do random uh, things. Yeah? Um, however, uh, for the chess computer example, um, here the environment, so 
if a chess computer plays against a human, then of course the, the environment is not deterministic because it cannot uh, know what the human opponent will do. Uh, okay, here we have the non-deterministic uh, environment. Then the question is whether the environment is discrete or continuous. I mean, that means if the states of the environment are discrete or continuous, uh, in case of a chess computer, the states are discrete. Um, in robotics, typically, the states are continuous. Um, and this is also a very important uh, distinction. Even if the number of states might be very large, take a chess computer, the number of uh, board uh, states is extremely large, but it is finite and uh, discrete. Okay, so now uh, knowledge-based systems. This is a very important term in artificial intelligence and therefore we look at it. Uh, um, yeah. As the term says, it's a system that is based on knowledge. Okay, if that would be everything, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's more or less it, but what we, what we try to do in AI now, in knowledge-based systems, um, yeah, let's look at this picture. We have a very strict separation uh, between um, the data and the data for a knowledge-based system is the knowledge. We need a strong, a strict separation between data and inference. That's, that's the point. Huh? Uh, so look here, we have the knowledge base. Maybe in first order logic we write down our knowledge or maybe in probabilistic logic. And then here we have an inference machine engine and this inference engine should ideally be universal. It should work for any type of data. So for example, suppose we have a medical expert system for this appendicitis, for example, then inside the knowledge base there is all the knowledge about medicine, about appendicitis, whatever. Huh? And here is a universal inference engine and if we have this strict separation, then of course we can just replace the knowledge base by a different knowledge base, maybe about how uh, digital equipment configures new computers. And then inside here we have this computer configuration knowledge and the same old inference engine works on this new knowledge base. On the other hand, if the inference engine would be highly optimized with respect to the particular knowledge, then you couldn't just replace the knowledge base by a, by a different one. No. So this is, this is the ideal goal, um, to have this uh, strict separation. No. Okay, but now um, the question is, the very important question is, how does the knowledge come into the knowledge base? And I don't know, did I tell you? I was in, on an AI course when I was a young AI researcher and there, there were lectures about knowledge acquisition. Huh? Knowledge acquisition is actually how, to, how this knowledge base acquires its knowledge. How does the knowledge get into the knowledge base? And on this course I attended in 1987. Huh? There was a lecture of many hours about knowledge acquisition. And this was really boring to me. You know what, what he was talking about? For many hours he was just talking about inter interview techniques how I, as a knowledge engineer, uh, can have an interview with a doctor, for example, or maybe with a lawyer, depending on the area. Huh? Um, and they, they were talking about problems that occurred. For example, if you talk to a human expert 
and he ask, you ask him one question today and the same question again tomorrow, you will get a different answer. Huh? Um, and you will also find out that there are contradictions. I mean, the thing he tells you today contradicts with what you hear tomorrow. You wouldn't even discover it while doing the interview, but then you hack it into the machine and then the machine will have a problem because there are con contradictions. And then you will get back to the expert and tell him, oh, there is a contradiction, tell me why. And the expert would say, I have no idea, it's all the truth I told you. Uh, so these, uh, you, you're getting really severe problems when you try to uh, get logic out of, out of a human. Huh? Uh, what's the reason for this? Yeah, let's talk about uh, a medical expert because I have some experience with uh, interviewing doctors. Not too much, but uh, enough. Uh, enough. Um, and uh, I mean, for example, Dr. Rampf down in 14 Nothelfer Krankenhaus in Weingarten. Um, I, I remember exactly, he said, when I sit there in my office and the patient enters the door, then I already see what disease he has. I just look at him, I watch him how he walks or come, he comes in, not always, but pretty often. This is really, I mean, you can type this into your expert system, huh? but I guess it wouldn't help too much. Huh? Um, and this is, this is, very common, very common among human experts. Or an, another example, um, we, uh, when I was in Munich, we had a project together with the University Hospital in Grenoble, in France, and it was about, um, about poison, uh, about poisoned patients, patients, and the question was, if a patient which was poisoned and is in coma, how to treat him. I mean, if the patient is not in coma, then you can ask him, what poison uh, did you eat or whatever? Was it a snake or was it alcohol or whatever? Uh, then you could ask him. But if this person is in coma, then you cannot ask him. And then you need to find out what type of poison it was. We had really long discussions with one of the best poison a treatment experts on this globe. Huh? And very often he said, when we asked him, oh, oh, tell us why this patient looks like that. Oh, uh, I don't know, it's just my feeling. Huh? That was the type of answers we got all the time. I'm sure this doctor is excellent, but he cannot explain why he does this or that decision. Uh, and this is, this is normal. I mean, uh, take other more extreme examples. Ask uh, uh, the best uh, tennis player why he hits the ball in this way or in that way. Ask this tennis player why he won the game. I mean, he cannot really explicitly tell you what, uh, what he did in every one thousand of a second. There is no chance. They just, I mean, why is there no chance? Because we humans, we learn by experience. We do have an internal uh, representation in our brain and we can just do it. But nobody needs to know why he does it. Or another example, ask a bird, you, if you watch these birds in your garden, ask a bird what he does when he lands on a stick. Would he tell you? No, there is no chance, but he can do it. That's the reason why it's complete nonsense um, to, to take so much time and uh, ask the experts for days and weeks until they are bored. Huh? So we need, we need automatic knowledge acquisition techniques, which is actually this branch. We need machine learning techniques. The robots need to learn their behavior such as we humans do it. This is the only chance uh, to get the knowledge into the machine. So this should always be the first approach. So always try first um, to teach the machine. 
and not to program it. And only if this is not possible, then maybe you have to ask some questions to the expert. Maybe there is some gap in the knowledge you can get out of a database or from the environment, and then you may ask some extra questions to the expert. That's actually what we did in this LexMate project. We had a nice database. We gathered uh, all we could get from the database, but there were some gaps, and about these gaps, we asked some few questions to the expert, and this still was almost too much for us. Huh? But if we would have tried to get all the knowledge out of the experts, this wouldn't have worked at all. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, I already said this about the separation of knowledge and inference. Um, yeah, of course, the, the first approach was to represent knowledge with a formal language. This has advantages because the engineer can read the formal language, can understand it, can debug it, uh, debug it um, can make changes, and so on. And these languages are propositional logic, first order logic, probability logic, fuzzy logic, or, I mean, decision tree concerning the language, it's the same as probabilistic logic, but it's uh, much nicer. We will see uh, when we come to this chapter. Okay, okay, yeah, but um, oh, you see, uh, <laughs> first of all, this slide is in German, uh, but second, we will just skip this chapter. Because uh, I already told you that logic is not part of this lecture here. Uh, so now we immediately go into search games and problem solving. Huh? Um, Applications where we need search are, for example, the chess computer or solving puzzle games, um, expert systems, automated theory improving, so all important areas for artificial intelligence. And that's why this field of um, exploring large search trees was developed in, inside the AI community. Okay, and these uh, search trees, are, they are really big, really big. Yeah? Um, so this is a, um, an image of an actually extremely small search tree. Uh, this tree has something like 1,000 uh, leaf nodes, which is nothing for a computer. But, I mean, in order to imagine what's going on, imagine you have a much larger tree, with many leaf nodes, and here you have this little star, and there is maybe, hopefully, one solution node. And you have this, to find this one solution node out of extremely many uh, leaf nodes, and such a tree may actually even be infinite. Huh? It may be infinite in depth and in width. Yeah, so this tree is a search tree for SLD resolution, which is the uh, inference process of an automated tier improver um, with depth 14. So the depth is 14 of this tree down here. And you, as you can see, the branching factor is between 1 and 2. It's, it's 1 or 2 all the time. And that's the reason why this, uh, this tree is so tiny. Uh, uh, imagine this tree would have a branching factor of 10 with a depth of 14. How many nodes would we then have here? Or could we have here? A fixed branching factor of 10 and a depth of 14. How many nodes? How many leaf nodes? Only just the leaf nodes. It would be 10 to the power 14. And, I mean, this laptop, I guess, has a resolution of 1,000 pixels. So with 1,000 1, pixels, uh, you can visualize not more than 500 leaf nodes. Huh? Um, but no chance for 10 to the power 14. 
Okay, let's take another example, chess. The branching factor in chess is said to be the average branching factor around 35. So let's take 30 and a depth of 50. Um, that would be a chess game with 50 half, mo half moves. That means every player has uh, 25 moves. Huh? Then the, the size of the, the, the number of leaf nodes is 30 to the power of 50, which is 7.2 times 10 to the power 73 leaves. That's a pretty big number. I mean, do you have a feeling about big and small numbers? Tell me something, some big number that has some real uh, implications on this world. What is the biggest uh, uh, number you know? Trillion. Trillion. I, I mean, yeah, but give me some uh, application. Where does it occur? Are there one trillion people or...? Um, Okay, so that's the amount of, let's say, virtual money uh, being somewhere on some banks and this would be a trillion. How many zeros would that have? So, um, 1,000 billion, but it depends whether it's a European or an American billion. Yeah? So an American billion has nine zeros and an American trillion would then have 12 zeros. Yeah? and the European trillion would then have 15 zeros. Huh? Okay, so the 10 to the power 15. But here we have 10 to the power 73. So which is a factor of 58 bigger. Huh? No, no, sorry. <laughs> Actually, not a factor of 58, a factor of 10 to the power of 58 bigger. Huh? So uh, the, this trillion dollars is actually nothing compared to this number. Huh? It's really, I mean, if you would, would see such a number of that size, this trillion dollars would be in the 59th decimal place behind the comma. Huh? So nobody would look that far. Um, but I mean, that means, let, let's talk about... Uh, um, let's talk about computing power because we want the computer to search this search tree, this chess search tree. Yeah, let's, let's do a, a little simple calculation. Uh, suppose we would have a PC that could do 10 to the power 9 um, could evaluate 10 to the power 9 port positions per second. That would be like a PC that does in one machine instruction an evaluation of the whole board. This is not realistic, but suppose we would have such an extremely good computer huh? that could do in one machine instruction one board evaluation. Then that would mean in order to evaluate all the leaves it would take 10 to the power 73 machine instructions. Okay? How many seconds is that? That's 10 to the power 64 seconds because he can do 10 to the power 9 uh, evaluations per second. So it's 10 to the power 64 seconds. How long is that? How old is our universe? So the estimates are 12 billion, American billion, or 12 milliarde years. Yeah? And one year has 10 to, about 10 to the power 7 seconds. So then it's 10 to the, so 10 to the power 10 years is the universe old, times t um, 10 to the power 9 uh, instructions per second, so that, no, sorry, 
But oh, we need to use the blackboard. Okay. What I want to know is how many universe ages does it take to evaluate such a chest tree? So our time for evaluation of 10 to the power 73 um, leaves. Yeah. Is equal to um, 10 to the power 73 leaves divided by the time um, yeah by um, how um, the time No, but uh, divided by the number of leaves per second, then we get the time. Okay? So, and we can, we, we said we can do 10 to the power 9 leaves per second. Okay? Uh, so that means it takes us 10 to the power 64 seconds. Um, and now the age of the universe. is about um, 1.2 times 10 to the power 10 years. And this is about um, one year has 3 times 10 to the power 7 seconds. So this is then about 3.6 times 10 to the power 17 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Now, how many universe ages does it take to evaluate one chest search tree? We just have to divide this number by this number. Uh, so then we have something like uh, 54, 40, um, 46. So something like 10 to the power 46 universe ages would we need. Huh? Um, so that's not really realistic. Huh? Now you could say, okay, we take all the computers on this planet, but this just gives you a, a factor of something like 10 to the power 9. Huh? Yeah, there are, I guess, 1 billion, maybe 10 billion computers on this planet. And if you would take all smartphones, maybe 15 uh, billion computers. But that doesn't help you. It just gives you a factor of 10 to the power 10. And then we are down to 10 to the power 40 universe ages it would take with all the computers working on this one chest search tree. Okay, so it's finite, but it's not realistic. There is no chance, no chance ever to compute one, one chess, complete chess search tree. Huh? No chance. And that's actually why this game of chess is so interesting. Huh? If it would be possible ever by means of computers to evaluate the whole search tree, then you would know this computer would know the optimal strategy and would always play with this optimal strategy. And because we cannot evaluate the full search tree, it's an interesting game. Okay, but now, I mean, the, the, the next frustrating news is this number is just the number of leaf nodes on this lowest level. Now the question is, 
how much more extremely difficult will it be for the computer to evaluate all the inner nodes too. And of course this computer has to traverse the inner nodes in order to come down to the leaf nodes. So we actually need the sum of all the nodes in the whole tree. And what is this? Yeah, this is nothing but the sum over all the levels. On the, on the highest level there is one <coughs> node. So this is this 30 to the power 0, which is 1. Uh, on the second level we have 30 nodes, then we have 900 nodes, and then 30 times 30 times 30 nodes, and so on. So the sum of all the powers of 30 is the sum of all the nodes in the whole chess search tree. And if you look at this, I mean, you immediately see that this is a geometric uh, series. Yeah, a finite geometric series. Here you see it's finite. And there is a formula. If you take this formula, then this is the formula. And if you evaluate it, we get 7.4 times 10 to the power 73. Isn't that funny? I mean, there must be a, a calculation error because it's the same figure as it was here. No, there is no calculation error. It's actually not the same figure. It's almost the same. And you see it's bigger. But it's not much bigger. Why is it not much bigger? Because on every level it gets 30 times more and yeah. so the leaves are 30 times more. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. The leaves are 30 times more than the level before. So in the, if we have so many leaves, then in the second last level, how many nodes do we have there? Yes, 30 times less, which is um, 10 to the power 72 times a third of this about, uh, which is uh, around 2. And that's we, why we get in this second digit two more. So, but now we only consider the second last level. How about the third last level? Yeah, this is a factor 900 less than on the last level. So we can, we can just neglect it. That's very important to learn that in realistic search trees, only the last level counts. You can neglect everything but the last level uh, when you do such estimates about computing resources or whatever. Um, even if the branching factor is pretty small like it is here, I mean here the average branching factor is between 1 and 2. Suppose we have a branching factor of exactly 2, then uh, on the second last level, um, the number of nodes is already just half of the number of nodes on the last level. But branching factors of two are, um, it almost never happens in AI. Okay, here we have a similar computation. Uh, as we already did on the blackboard. Um, and here we have a heavily trimmed search tree. Yeah, you see many of the branches of this tree here, they're just cut. Huh? That's why this tree doesn't look too nice. Huh? Um, and that's what we are going to do in the following. Our goal has to be to make these trees much smaller. Just cut many of these infinite leaves such that the remaining tree is as small as possible. At least it has to be as small uh, such that our computer uh, can traverse the tree in, yeah, in what time? The time actually depends on your patience. So that's the definition of realistic surgery. A search tree is, has a realistic size 
if your computer can traverse it in the time you are able to wait. Okay. Now, questions. Some questions arise. For example, why do good chess players exist? And nowadays, uh, and nowadays also good chess computers. I mean, the answer I already, I already gave it to you, because these good human chess players, they don't expand the whole tree. They just look at the relevant parts, finite small parts of the search tree. Um, but how, how do they do this? And how do modern comp uh, chess computers do it? That's, uh, of course, an interesting question. Um, a similar question, why do mathematicians find proofs for propositions in which the search space is even larger? I mean, the search space in, in proving mathematical theorems is extremely much bigger than uh, this search space for uh, chess computing. It's typically infinite. Um, yeah, so these are interesting questions we are going to answer in this chapter. But let's start with a very simple example, with this eight puzzle uh, tiling example. So the eight puzzle has a, a three by three matrix with uh, nine fields, um, and we have eight tiles, and they are arranged in a more or less random order. And the goal is to move these tiles such that at the end I get some goal state, maybe like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, um, ordered in rows. This is, of course, a search problem. If we start with this state, um, I mean, what we look at is where is the empty uh, spot here where there is no tile. And here we have two possible actions. We can move the 5 here, we can move the 8 here. So we have a branching factor of 2. And if the 5 is there, then the empty place is here, and then we have three possible actions. Move the 2, move the 4, move the 5. Huh? So then we have a branching factor of 3, and so on. So this uh, gives us a search tree. An example for the search tree you can see here. So we start with the empty field here, branching factor of 3. Here we have a branching factor of 4. Here it is 2, and here it is 2. Yeah. Ah, yeah, and if you look at this example, that's pretty nice because on this level you can see we have all branching factor 3 again. Why? We start here with the empty field um, at, the, at the, uh, the border here. And then we get here the empty field in the middle with the branching factor 4. And of course, all the successor states, they, they have the empty field at the border again. And here too. And here too. And therefore, we get a branching factor of 3 here again. Okay, why is this nice? Because from here on, if you look, uh, if I ask you how does the search tree below this node here look like, what is the answer? Hmm? Like the second, what do you mean with the second, this one? No, like the second line. Like the second line? Yeah, what's that? The, I mean, it will be like the same as it will go like... Yeah, it will be recursively the same as we had when we started here. Yeah? And this will be for all these nodes. And that's why uh, when we are here, we know the structure of the whole search tree. And because we know that from here on everything repeats, we can uh, compute average branching factor just by looking at this. 
Huh? And how do, how, we, how do we do this? I mean, what does intuitively average branching factor mean? That means, suppose we have a tree with uh, two levels. Yeah? Level 0, 1, 2. So the depth of the tree is 2. Now, suppose the branching factor in both levels would be the same. Let's say B. We have a branching factor of B that we do not know. And we know that the depth of the tree is 2. So then, the number of leaf nodes in such a tree with branching factor B and depth 2 would be b to the power 2. Okay? That's the number of leaf nodes. I mean, for example, if the branching factor is 2 and the depth is 2, then of course we have four leaf nodes. Why? Yeah, because of that. And if the branching factor is 3, then 3 to the power of 2 is 9. We would have 9 leaf nodes. And if the branching factor of b is b, then after two levels, b squared is the number of leaf nodes. Okay, we do not know b, but we know the number of leaf nodes. How much is it? Eight. eight. Just count. Eight leaf nodes. So b squared is eight. That means b is square root of eight. So the average branching factor is square root of 8, which is 2.83. Huh? And that's very nice because we know that recursively this tree repeats. That, uh, so that means for the whole tree, no matter how deep it is, uh, yeah, no, it's not exactly true. Um, if the number of level is ev levels is even, then uh, the average branching factor is exactly square root, square root of 8. That's nice to know. So for the 8 puzzle, if we start with such an initial node and we do this naive search, then we have an average branching factor of 2.83. But of course we can do it better. Um, with a very, very little modification. No, let's go back here. Let's look what we <coughs> do here. We start with this node, and then we do this move, and we do this move, and what can you see here? Same the same state again. This is not really intelligent. Huh? That's actually stupid. No human player, I guess, would do this. So, move the empty tile to the left and then to the right again, back. You wouldn't do that. So, if you avoid such loops of length 2, this is a loop of length 2. If we would avoid loops of length 2, then we would get this tree. Huh? So, here we would still have the branching factor of 3, but here, we no longer have the branching factor of 4 because we do not... Um, I mean, first we did this move. The, um, no, move the 5 up. And here we do not move the 5 down again. So we just omit this move. And that's why we have branching factor of 3 here. Here we have only 1. Here we have only 1, 2. Um, and so the branching factor actually everywhere is uh, by one smaller than it was before, except, except the first move. Huh? In the first move you have the full branching factor because there was no predecessor step. And that's why um, we cannot exactly say it is square root of 8 minus 1, the average branching factor, because initially it was by one bigger but it's approximately 1.8. Okay. So if we um, remove all these uh, short cycles, 
then we have an average branching factor of 1.8, which is actually not too big. 1.8, it's, it's uh, smaller than 2, um, yeah. Okay, um, and we will, we, will, uh, we will see how much computing time it takes to evaluate the whole tree and so on. But before, um, we define what we mean um, with the term of a search problem. What is a search problem? A search problem is defined by first we need a state. Description of the state of the world. In the 8 puzzle it's simple. It's just the configuration of our puzzle. Then we need a starting state of course. We need a goal state of course. We need actions in, the, uh, in case of the 8 puzzle. The actions are move the empty tile into one of the allowed directions. Then uh, what is the solution? A solution is the path of all the moves. Let's look at the, this example. Um, yeah, for example, here. Here you see um, the tiles ordered in rows perfectly. So the solution is this move, this move, and this. This is a solution. Um, yeah, then we need a cost function. Uh, the cost function for this 8 puzzle is pretty simple. We have to assign costs to every move. And uh, we, we assume, at least for the moment, that all moves do have the same cost. If the costs are all the same, then we uh, can assume they are all one. Huh? Um, then we do have a state space. I mean, this um, immediately um, follows from the definition of state. Uh, it's the set of all states and then of course we have a search tree. Um, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. This is actually not true. This, the states are the nodes and the actions are the edges. Yeah, so this is, this is not correct. I, I'll correct it. Um, of course, the leaves are states, that's true, but uh, the inner nodes, they are also states. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, we can omit this slide. This is just the same thing applied to the 8 parcel. Um, yeah, then here we define formally the term of branching factor. The branching factor is the number of successor states of a state S. And so you can see, of course, this branching factor B depends on the state, on the node where we are, unless we have a constant uh, branching factor. Then here we define the effective branching factor. And be careful, this effective branching factor is a little bit different from the average branching factor we had before. Now let's look at the definition and then I'll ask you what's different. The effective branching factor of a tree of depth D with N total nodes is defined as the branching factor that a tree with constant branching factor equal depth and equal n would have. So, now, I mean, yeah, it's a difficult question, but what's the difference to this average branching factor we just computed for our 8 puzzle? You know what we did before? Before we took the number of leaf nodes here and then we computed this B. So we take the number of leaf nodes and we assume above from this there is a constant branching factor and so we, co we could compute this square root of 8. What is the difference here? The difference is 
we no longer take the number of leaf nodes, we take the total number of nodes on all the levels, all together. So now we ask, suppose we have a tree, I don't know, maybe, maybe this tree has 20 nodes. Now suppose we have a tree with the same depth, with, which is here 3, and with 20 nodes all together, what would be the branching factor if it would be constant? That's the question here. And back there it was, we just took the number of leaf nodes. I mean, in this example, we just took the number of leaf nodes because this is easier to compute. Huh? But in, in uh, realistic applications, your computing time is proportional to the, number or to the total number of nodes. And that's why we put the total number of nodes into this definition. The difference in the result is not very big. Huh? But this is, this is the, the exact uh, definition. Okay, and another very important term is completeness. A search algorithm is called complete if it finds a solution for every solvable problem. A solvable problem means if there is a solution. Huh? So a search algorithm is called complete if it finds a, a solution if there is a solution. If a complete search algorithm terminates without finding a solution, then the problem is unsolvable. That's actually the important consequence. No? Look at an example. Suppose we have a large search tree. Um, and then now at the root node we start our computer and this computer runs down and uh, searches through the tree in some manner. After a certain time this algorithm stops and uh, prints out the message no solution found. So now what does that mean to you? First of all it just tells you no solution found. Uh, so does that mean there is no solution? Or does it mean the algorithm was too stupid to find a solution which actually was there? And this is very important to distinguish. And uh, here it's, uh, it helps us to know whether this algorithm is complete or not. If this search algorithm is complete, then it guarantees to find the solution if there is one. So, suppose here we have our solution. Here, this is the solution node. Then if the algorithm is complete, in finite time it will find the solution. So, on the other hand, this means if a complete algorithm finds no solution, then you know there is no solution then you know the problem is unsolvable. And of course we always want to have complete search algorithms. If a search algorithm is incomplete, this is not really nice. Um, yeah, okay. Now, um, let's get back to the effective branching factor. This definition is about the branching factor that we get if we take all the nodes in the tree and assume we have a constant branching factor. Okay. Now the number of nodes in a tree with a fixed branching factor B is the sum over all the levels of the tree um, of B to the power I. And this of course is the well-known geometric series this is the formula for the geometric series. And now computing an average branching factor, what do you know? You know the number of nodes in the tree, you know the depth. Now look, here we have n is equal to this right hand side 
and there are three variables in this equation. We know two of them, so that's perfect. There is only one unknown. You have to solve this equation for the remaining one unknown. And that's easy, isn't it? No, it's not. Why is it not easy? I mean, it's one equation with one unknown that's trivial. I mean, uh, you do it in, in school in uh, seventh uh, class or something like that. Why didn't you do that at school? Of course, because your teacher uh, never gave you such a problem, because the teacher knew that would be hard. That's a problem we have at school in mathematics. The teachers never tell you um, that he just selects, selects a few easy problems out of these infinitely many very hard problems. So you have no idea at school about uh, how interesting and funny the mathematics world is. At school it's just boring because you're always on the autobahn and driving on the autobahn is boring. Huh? But driving off-road between the cliffs and rocks and mud and dirt, and that's interesting. Huh? But you never experienced it at school, but here you will have it. And I ask you, uh, why is it a little bit rocky here? Why is that not trivial to solve this equation? So, this is your first exercise. Huh? I mean, how, how would you, how would you um, approach this problem? Of course, first you take a fixed n. Let's say n equals 10,000 and d equals 5. And then you have everything you need. And then you look at the equation and you will see uh, it's not really trivial. I mean, it is solvable. You should be able to solve it. But it's not trivial. Huh? Okay, now and here we have a first theorem. For heavily branching finite search trees with a large constant branching factor, almost all nodes are on the last level. I mean, you know already why this theorem is true. We discussed it at the example of the tree with a branching factor of 30. Yeah? On the second last level, uh, we have only one thirtieth of the number of nodes, and so on. Okay, and the proof is an exercise in the book. So, this is actually not very hard. Okay, now we introduce another uh, search example, um, which we will use to test our search algorithms. This is a map a street map of southern Germany, a little bit of Austria also. Um, we have cities, we have uh, connections between the cities and numbers on these connections which may be the number of kilometers you have to drive but you can also view it as the number of minutes it takes you to drive by train or whatever. Huh? Okay, yeah, I mean, we, we don't need this slide. And maybe we finish after this slide. Um, we call a search algorithm optimal if, it, if a solution exists, always finds the solution with the lowest cost. And this definition, of course, is related to this example. Uh, I mean, if you want to drive from Frankfurt to, um, let's say, München, then you can go like this, you can go like that, you can go like this, and many other uh, paths. And the question is, which one is the best, the shortest? Huh? And a search algorithm is optimal if it always finds 
the, uh, the shortest solution. And shortest here means the solution with the lowest sum of all the costs. Uh? Okay, and yeah, now pro some properties of our eight parcel problem. It is deterministic, of course, it's observable. Um, and yeah, with so called offline algorithms. What is an offline algorithm? Look, an offline algorithm is, for example, what Google Maps does. Typically, your car navigation systems also use an offline algorithm uh, because before you start your, your journey, you, you look at Google Maps. This gives you a plan where you have to drive and then you sit into the car. An online algorithm would be um, Google Maps tells you if you want to go to Berlin from here, it tells you, okay, first drive to Wurzach. And then I will do some more computation and tell you what to do next. Yeah? No, that would be an online algorithm. Yeah? Uh, and actually your, your car navigation system is kind of an online algorithm because maybe there is a traffic jam and then you need a detour and so on. So it's, it's a combination of offline and online. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we, we will now discuss such search algorithms and how we can optimize them, how we can use heuristics and so on. Um, but they're all offline. We will only consider such offline algorithms um, even so, online algorithms are very interesting. For example, reinforcement learning is one uh, type of online algorithm uh, that can even um, optimize itself uh, by means of uh, machine learning techniques. Okay, but now we uh, stop for today.